Come in. Welcome. I am E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the world of terrifying imagination. Our story deals with fate. Some call it luck. Whatever it is, it works in the strangest ways to reward us or defeat us. Fate walked into Charles Powell's life in the person of Clint Livitz. Now look, Clint, or whatever your name is, I don't like you, and I don't like your insinuations. Now if you don't get out of my office and leave these premises immediately, I'll have you put out. You must be putting on an act, Mr. Charles Powell. Maybe this will jolt your memory. Three, five, four, one, oh, six, three. What? Yeah. <laughs> I thought that would do it, Charlie. I thought that might help you remember. <laughs> mystery drama No Hiding Place was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sidney Sloan and stars Larry Haynes. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. And now another tale of the ball and chain at Kellogg Special K presents overweight on an overnight train. Is the seat taken? Please, sit down. Mm. You have exceptional legs. Oh. <laughs> uh, but why is one of them attached to a ball and chain? This ball and chain? It's a symbol. Funny, I would have sworn it was a ball and chain. I mean symbolic. Because carrying around a few extra pounds can be just like lugging around this ball and chain. I see. May I suggest something? Uh -huh. Try a bowl of Special K, skim milk, orange juice, and coffee. It's the Special K breakfast. Will it make me lose weight? No. Oh. You must also exercise and eat smart at every meal. I see. Do you know the Special K breakfast is less than 240 calories, 99% fat-free, and delicious? No, but if you hum a few bars... And that's another tale of the ball and chain. Your happy ending could begin with the Kellogg's Special K breakfast. That's Kellogg's Special K. Uh, good night. Well, it's all right to tell one lie, isn't it? You can't. Then how about lying just a little bit? Not a little bit. You mean you can never lie? Never. Well, why not? Because when you tell a lie... Yeah? It gets stuck inside your heart. You mean that just one lie will make your heart dark? Makes you sad, too. Oh. Then what should you do if you tell a lie? Well, you just say I'm sorry. And then what? Then the light goes inside your heart. Oh, the light goes on? Yeah. Oh, a light doesn't really go on in your heart, does it? Yes, it does. Well, how do you know? Because... Because the light in your heart will shine in your eyes. Oh. And, and then you'll be happy. Hmm. I wonder why people tell lies. I wonder why, too. From the Franciscans, with love. Everything looked right to Charles Powell that crisp September morning when he walked into his executive office at the J.P. McCready Company. And why shouldn't it? Charlie Powell was a big shot there. At 37, executive vice president of one of the largest manufacturers of heavy construction equipment in the country. And he had done it all in less than 12 years. It was a real-life Horatio Alger story even to his being engaged to J.P. McCready's daughter, Allison. How could anything go wrong? But it did. The moment he walked into his private office. Yes, Elsie? There's someone to see you. Appointment? No, sir, but he says that you'll see him. Mr. Powell, mm -hmm. maybe I'd better come in and explain. Yes, all right, come in. Sorry if I sound strange, but really, Mr. Powell, that man is kind of frightening. Frightening? Well, he just sits there and grins at me. I, I told him he didn't see people without an appointment. He said, oh, he'll see me. Just tell him it's an old friend, Clint. You know anybody by that name? Clint? Clint? No, it doesn't ring a bell. All right, send him in. I'll get rid of him. Okay. Don't say I didn't warn you. Mr. Powell will see you. 
Nice of you to see me, Mr. Powell. Well, I try to see everybody, Mr. Uh... Just Clint. I don't think you ever knew me by anything but Clint. You must remember, Mr. Powell. Well, I'm sorry, but I Come don't... Come on, give it a try. Give it a good try. Now, look here, I'm busy, and I have neither the time nor the patience. You must be putting on an act, Mr. Charles Powell. Uh, maybe this will jolt your memory. Three, five, four, one, oh, six, three. What? Yeah. <laughs> I thought that would do it, Charlie. I thought that might help you remember. Charles? Mm. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. McCready. I guess it was daydreaming. Something bothering you, young man? Uh, no, no, no. I hope not. Here I take you to the best French restaurant in town. You pick at your food, gaze into space, send your dinner away hardly touched. Oh, did I uh, send all that good food back without eating it? You did. I uh, I uh, particularly wanted to see you alone, Charles, because uh, I have a little news for you. News? What uh, what kind of news, Mister McCready? And that's another thing. You're so damned formal with me, Mister McCready. Do you realize that in exactly five weeks you're going to be one of the family? Yes, of course I realize. How could I overlook it when Allison keeps reminding me regularly? Very well, then. Do you think it proper to call your uh, father-in-law to be Mr. McReady? If you don't start calling me John... Okay. John, it'll be. I'm, uh... I'm going to leak a little information to you. Yes? As you know, I've been, uh thinking of stepping down from the presidency of the company. Yes, well, it has been rumored, but I wish you'd reconsider. Now, sincerely, the place wouldn't be the same without you. Oh, I'll still be there, Charlie. I'm not giving up my stock. The name of the company will still be J.P. McReady Company. The only difference will be that uh, you will be sitting at my desk. Sitting at your desk? Well, I, I thought Hedges was slated to take over when you stepped down. No. Well, Tom was seriously considered, but he's a bit too old for the job. No, the company needs young blood. Well, I, I'm uh, really bowled over. Well, I've watched you grow, come up on merit, ability. You're going to go far, my boy. Of course, uh, the board will have to vote on your appointment, but... Uh, that, as the saying goes, is in the bag. Well, there's uh, something you've omitted, uh, John. You haven't asked me if I wanted the job. Is it necessary to ask? I remember another lunch with you several years ago. We got talking about ambitions, and you said that you would never be satisfied with second best. It had to be the top job, or you'd move on. Yes. But that was before this morning. Hmm? What? Uh, nothing. Just mumbling. I'd like to know how you feel about it, Charles. Well, even to be considered for the position is an honor, Miss, uh, John. And your answer? Let me think it over. I must think it over. Trying to collect your life insurance, Charles? Uh, what? The way you're driving. Are you out to get me, yourself, or both of us? Oh, I, I'm sorry, dear. I guess I didn't realize how fast I was going. This car has more power than it needs. More than I need. I'm sorry. At least it gave us a topic for conversation. Hmm? What did? You're driving. Darling, I'm the girl you asked to marry you. Something is troubling you, something big. <sighs> Allison, did your father tell you what he's planning? Dad never tells me anything. I have an idea he thinks of me as a bird friend. He wants me to take over the presidency of the company. That's marvelous. Couldn't have made a better choice. What, you're prejudiced. But it's a nice kind of prejudice. I, uh... I don't think I'll accept. What? But, darling, it's right for you. You've worked toward that goal. You're the right man for the job. Am I? What is this? Lack of confidence, buck fever... You're being ridiculous, darling. No, I'm being practical and sensible. My being president of the McCready Company would bring nothing but trouble. What are you saying? I'm even considering resigning my present job. Why? Allison. Tell me. 
Whatever it is, I'll never stop loving you. I'll tell you. When I get up enough courage, please, darling, be patient with me. Just be patient. I love you, too. So you finally got here. Thought you were going to forget our appointment. Uh, you didn't really think that, Clint. No, I knew you'd come. You wouldn't dare not to come. Sit. You got it with you? Yes, I've got it. In small bills. Five stands, as specified. Let's have it. Here. Mm. And a pretty manila envelope, too. Nice and neat. Thanks. Now, look, I don't know how much longer I can do this. You'll do it as long as I say. And if I run out of money? You'll just have to scrounge around and find more. Well, I'm thinking of quitting my job. You wouldn't want to do that, Charlie. Well, suppose... Suppose it gets too much for me and I say, go ahead, spill what you know. Oh, you wouldn't do that. You're going to marry a very rich girl. A couple of extra yards ain't going to change your manner of living. Even a couple extra grand. <sighs> how long... Are you going to suck my blood? I don't like the way you put that, Charlie. I'd rather you'd think of it like it was sort of, uh, sharing the wealth. You got the bread. I got nothing. This way, we both got something. I got a nice living, and you... Why, uh, you got your freedom. <laughs> Yes, Mr. Mc... Uh, yes, John. Uh, sorry to bother you at this hour. You wanted to sleep, were you? At 10.15, no. The, um... Uh, the reason I'm calling... Yes. Is something bothering you, my boy? Well, I, uh... I've had some things on my mind lately. I'm sorry it was so noticeable. Well, it occurred to me that a young man gets a bit absent-minded as the day of his wedding approaches. Perhaps a bit frightened. No, 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 it isn't that, J.P. Oh, uh, excuse me, John. Someone's at my door. Hold on. Just a moment. Forgive me for coming shh, here. Shh, shh. I've got your father on the phone. Come in, darling. Hello, John. Uh, it was just the porter with a package. What were you saying? Oh, nothing really. I'm just concerned. Whatever's troubling you can be taken care of. I'm backing you all the way. Well, I, uh, I appreciate your feelings, J.P., but there really is no cause for concern. I'll snap out of this in a day or so. Good. It's reassuring to hear you say that. Now, forgive me for disturbing you. No, no, I wasn't disturbed. Thanks for calling. Good night. Good night, J.P. Even Dad notices that something is wrong. Yeah. I haven't seen you in three days. Are you trying to tell me something? All I, uh... All I want to tell you is that I... love you very much. From a distance? Hmm? I called you at your office twice this afternoon. Allison... Allison, I, I can't keep this from you. I thought I could, but every day, every hour, it grows bigger. Until now, it feels as though it, it, it's going to engulf me. And you, our life, everything that has meaning for me. Sorry. No, 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 hear me out. And then if you want to go out that door quietly, I won't say anything more, and you can forget that you've ever known me. You loved you? Are you trying to say you don't want to marry me? That you stop loving me? Darling, it's because I love you that I'm going to tell you. I considered keeping the whole matter from you, riding out the trouble and probably overcoming it. Darling, I... how little you know me. No matter what the trouble is, I want to be with you. If you want me. <sighs> Allison, I'm a fraud. What? I'm not Charles Powell. It's a name I assumed to hide my real identity. Want me to go on? Yes, darling. Go on. At the age of 22, I was charged and convicted of murder and sent to San Quentin for life. I was innocent. Evidence, circumstantial evidence. Court-appointed attorney who didn't know what to do or didn't care. A weak effort to appeal, which was refused, and there I was, at 22, in prison for life. Chance of a parole only after serving 20 years. I'd be old, all my young life confined in prison. So, when I had a chance to get out... You escaped. ...and ran for two years. 
Do you know what it means to be hunted? You can't get a job. You have no place to live. You can't ever sleep for fear someone will see you and turn you in. Oh, darling. I was ready to give myself up. When I suddenly discovered that it wasn't necessary to run any longer, I picked up a two-week-old newspaper and read a report of my death. What? Yes, a man... A man had been burned to death in a flophouse fire. The only thing he had on him was something that I had kept, my only possession. A locket belonging to my mother. It had a picture of her taken when she married my father. And it had been stolen from me as I lay asleep in a freight car. I guess the thief thought it was gold. It was just cheap gold plate. And the man was identified as you? My mother and father's names were inscribed on the back. The man was so badly burned that the locket was the only thing that could possibly identify him. And after two years of hunting, the authorities were glad to close the file. On Robert Hagen. Robert Hagen? Sounds so strange. The name doesn't fit you. Oh, it sounds strange to me, too, now. Darling, I'm innocent. I never did it. It was all a mistake. I don't doubt that for an instant, dearest. I only wish you'd never told me. I had to tell you. I... You see, someone knows who I am. He's blackmailing me. When you're being blackmailed, you don't have many alternatives. Charles Powell's whole life, his future, the happiness of the woman he loves, all hang by a very thin, flimsy thread. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. I'm High Brown, producer of Radio Mystery Theater. And as you may imagine, I'm excited about this new adventure in modern radio. This new statement of radio's marvelous power to stir the imagination. Now, we're wondering about your reaction about who you are and how you like what we're doing. So to encourage you to get in touch with us, we're holding a drawing for three weeks. Fifty prizes a week, two AM-FM stereophonos, two travel clock radios, and 46 anthologies of modern suspense. Just mail us your name and address, and you're eligible. Of course, we'd like knowing whether your glad radio drama is back, but name and address will do it. To Mystery Theater, Box 50, Radio City Station, New York, 119. That's Box 50, Radio City Station, New York, 119. All for good everywhere, unless locally prohibited. It's always a pleasure to add beautiful new furniture to your home. And it's even more a pleasure when you can save substantially on its purchase. You can do both this week at Adele Hunt's. 7015 Snyder Plaza during Adele Hunt's Great Winter Furniture Clearance Sale. Take advantage of Adele Hunt's staff of professional interior designers at no extra cost, of course, and save on such famous brands as Henriden, Drexel, Thomasville, Lazy Boy, and many others. For instance, there are exciting accent pieces on sale from Baker, Tomlinson, and Irwin Lambert. The hundreds of fine values in bedroom, dining room, living room, and occasional furniture may not be equaled again. Even a large selected group of lamps and pictures are as much as 60% off the regular price. So shop early while selections are good during Adele Hunt's great winter sale. Adele Hunt's, 7015 Snyder Plaza, near the corner of Lover's Lane and Hillcrest in University Park, where Dallas buys with confidence. Open tonight till 9 p.m. Charles Powell chose to give in to his blackmailer. He didn't envision the trouble that was building up for him. Just keep paying and I'll keep my mouth shut, his blackmailer assured him. But then something happened that threatened to destroy Charles' fragile security. Yes, Elsie? Mr. Hamill is here to see you. George Hamill? Well, we're not playing tennis until tomorrow. I know that, Charlie. I've got something else to talk about. Business. Business? Yours or mine? Mine. But it concerns you. Okay, come in, George. Sorry to barge in on you. I know you're busy. Well, I'm never too busy to see George Hamill, rising young district attorney and next governor of the state. <laughs> <laughs> Your humor creaks, Charlie. 
Seriously, I've got something that sort of disturbs me. Oh? What does? Last night in a bar over on the west side, a man was bashed over the head with a bottle. He's in serious condition. Well, what has that got to do with me? Well, the man who did the bashing, an ex-con by the name of Clinton Livitz... Yes? He's asking for you. Says you'll go as bail. Now, what I want to know is, how does a guy like you get mixed up with a Joe like that? Uh, George, what did you think? That he and I were buddies or something? I, I didn't know what to think. Well, I, I, I do know the man. He, uh... He applied for a job with the company a week or so ago. The foreman who interviewed him discovered he was an ex-con, and uh, and uh, he refused to hire him. It was brought to my attention when one of the societies that helps ex-cons called me. So you got him a job in the plant? No, 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 I couldn't. I mean, I wouldn't go over the head of the foreman, but I, I did see him, and I, uh, you know, handed him a couple of dollars. A couple and... of dollars? You know how much money he had on him when we brought him in? $276. Oh, well, uh, m maybe he got lucky at the races with the money I gave him. How much was it? Oh, gee, I don't remember. Uh, 15 20 I just took it out of my pocket and handed it to him. It was, a, you know, a way of easing my conscience. I felt bad about the way our foreman had treated him. Well, take my word for it. This Clint Livitz is a bad customer. Stay away from him. Uh -huh. uh, what, uh, what will become of him? Where you'll go back to the pen where he belongs. Well, what's the bail set at? Five thousand. And you're not seriously considering putting it up, are you? No, I was just asking. Because if you are, that's the last you'll see of your money. And for that matter, Mr. Livitz, he'll jump bail. Please, to... George, I'm a big boy now, and I think I can make my own decisions. Well, <laughs> who would have thought it? Charles Powell Bleeding Heart. Now, look, we've been friends for over five years. When you were running for D.A., I backed you with substantial contributions. I like you. You're my friend. Now, let's not kick that all out because of some stupid disagreement. No. Let's not kick it out. I'm sorry, Charlie. But I just can't understand what your connection with that ex-con is. Now, Mr. Powell... I hope you'll understand. I accept Clinton Livett's case with strong reservations. Yes, I understand, Mr. As Cartwright. As an attorney, I... Well, how shall I put it? You, uh... You don't like your client. Exactly. However, I shall do my best to get him off. Or at least get him a light sentence. I'm extremely pessimistic about Mr. Livett's even showing up for trial. Yes. George Hamill also said he expected that Livett's would jump his bail. And you would forfeit $5,000. Yes, I know. And that doesn't disturb you? No, no, I... I don't believe he'll run. I see. You want to speak with him? He's been released. He's waiting in the other office. Uh, not particularly. He says he wants to see you. Oh. Well, in that case, yes, I'll, I'll see him. Send Mr. Livitz in. I'll leave you alone. If you need me, I'll be in the other office. Now, come in, Mr. Livitz. Mr. Powell will speak to you. Thanks. I'll be back when you call. Just flip the switch on the intercom. Yes, I will. Are you sure know how to complicate things, Clint? Story of my life. Do you realize you could go up for one to five years for what you've done? No. It couldn't happen. What do you mean it couldn't happen? Because you wouldn't let it happen, Charlie. Look, even with the best lawyer defending you, he can't guarantee he'll win the case. You won't let me go to prison, Charlie. I'm, I'm doing my best for you, but... No buts. I'm not going back to the pen. Okay. Okay, you're not going back. Now, suppose... Just suppose, during the trial, if things look bad, yeah. we, uh, we get you out of town and let you run for it. Forfeit your bail. <laughs> oh, 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 you'd like that, wouldn't you? I'd be out of your hair, and all it would cost you would be the five G's for the bail. No, 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 no. I'd, I'd give you a substantial sum. Oh, Mr. Powell. No sale. I'm too old to run. Well, su suppose I, uh, I, I got you out of the country. With a good hunk of bread stashed away for me? Swiss bank account. I don't know. Why don't we, uh, play it by ear? Come in. You, uh, wanted to see me, J.P.? Uh, yes. Uh, can you spare a minute? Yeah, sure. 
I've heard it on the grapevine that you were... How shall I put it? That you were aiding some ex-convict in trouble with the police. Is that true? Yes, it's true, John. And I think I know what kind of grapes grow on that grapevine. All right. Now, George Hamill. Oh, that damn busy party. Why can't he stick to his job and... Now, George is a friend. He tells me that the man you're, uh, protecting is a rather reprehensible character. Will you and... let me explain? It's, it, it's just a matter of policy, my helping this man. Policy? Well, yes, you, uh, you did ask me a few days ago to consider taking over the job of running this company. You're going to accept? Well, I was, uh, I was going to tell you today. Wonderful. Wonderful news. Allison will be delighted. I know she's been worried about your seeming reluctance. Oh, no, no, not reluctant any longer. In fact, I've got all sorts of ideas about what I want to do. This business of giving a hand to ex-convicts is just one of them. Do you realize what this would mean in publicity for the company? To take an interest in the rehabilitation of men who would otherwise be lost, a burden to the taxpayer? I'm going to hire a PR man. We're going to be the big corporation with a heart, J.P. <laughs> Lies. Lies, lies, and more lies. How, how can I keep all these phony stories straight, Allison? It's like a long, dark tunnel with no ending. It will end, and it will all turn out all right. Don't lose your courage. Now I love you and need you. We'll worry this out together. You know, you know what I've considered. What? Going to the authorities and saying, look, I'm Robert Hagen, the man you think died 13 years ago. No, darling, they'd throw you back into prison. Well, I'd hire the best lawyer. No, no, John, no, no. Please don't take such a chance. What would I do without you? Darling. Darling, I don't know how much longer I can stand this pressure. I've got to do something. Something to free myself. Why not give him a lot of money and ask him to go away? Promise to stay away forever. In Hargrave's office, I suggested that he jump bail and get out of the country. What did he say? Well, when I mentioned a big sum, I didn't exactly say how much. You know, a Swiss bank account. He was interested. Did he say he would accept? Well, we were interrupted, and he didn't say definitely. Offer him anything. Just get him to go. Well, how would I get a large sum of money together? I have some small investments, a fair bank account, but what he might want would be beyond me. You forget you're marrying a very rich girl. Oh, no, no. No, I wouldn't think of that. Don't give me that male ego business. I've got money. That was nice enough to give me a big hunk when I was 21. Now, look, look, Allison. With all my earthly goods. I've Ian Dow. We're not married yet. You're not going to back out now, not after I've endowed you with all my earthly... Or is it worldly goods? <laughs> you know, you are the nuttiest woman I've ever known. You see, I've got to laughing. Darling, all our troubles are going to evaporate. Vanish. No. It won't work, Allison. It'll never work. But you said... No. Clint Livitz will never stick to any bargain. He'll want more, and he'll want more. He'll never be satisfied. If we got him out of the country. What's to keep him from coming back when he's broke or even threatening us from abroad? I gave him $1,000 in cash only a few days ago. When he was picked up in the bar, he had only about $270-some dollars left. In a matter of two days, he'd squandered over 700 But if he were made to understand that the sum agreed on was all he was going to get. Can I make you understand? We're not dealing with a rational, honest man... He'll agree to anything. And then he'll... When his money runs out or he decides he wants more, he'll... He'll be right back. What can you do? There are only... Two things one can do about a blackmailer. Keep on paying and paying forever. And the other? And the other... Just two ways to deal with a blackmailer. Charles now must face his conscience. The thought that has been in the hidden recesses of his mind has been spoken aloud. We will be back shortly with Act Three. Oh, all right. When you say butter, you said a lot of things nobody else can say. Yeah. When you say butter, you've gone as far as you can go to get the very best. 
think about it. You decide. For yourself. Well, sure, the Budweiser people really do believe that brewing beer right does make a difference. But even that's up to you. St. Louis. Who knows how to help you solve your shopping problems? The Better Business Bureau knows. Honey, the TV set just won't work. Who do I take it to? The lady down the street took hers into a place that charged her more than her set was worth. Gosh, I don't know. I'll tell you what to do, folks. Who are are you? you? I'm the man from your Better Business Bureau. Now, before you take your set in for repairs, shop around and check into a firm's reputation. You know, that's even more important than the price. Friends and neighbors can help, or you can ask for a few names of previous customers to find out if they were satisfied. And since the amount you pay will vary from one place to another, it's up to you to find out in advance what a service will cost if you have it fixed at home. Just another consumer tip from your Better Business Bureau. Charles Powell's life has reached a climax. He must make a decision to rid himself forever of his blackmailer. And perhaps that very decision will destroy his life and the life of the woman he loves. The alternative is to keep paying and paying, never feeling safe. Oh, Allison, I I was... uh... You were expecting him, weren't you? Yes, yes. I gathered as much when I called you at the office this afternoon. Aren't you going to ask me in? Uh, yeah, come in. You were so evasive. Well, he, uh, wanted to see me this evening. He, uh, wants more money. And you're going to give it to him? Well, I haven't many choices, have I? You mentioned one. No. No, Allison, I'm, I'm sorry I let that slip out. I didn't mean it. It, I, I couldn't go through with that if I wanted to. I could. What? Honey, you don't know what you're saying. I know very well what I'm saying. How long do you think you can keep this business hidden? Well, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe forever. Look, look, he's not a young man. All those years in prison, the kind of life he's led. How many years do you think he has left? He could die tomorrow. He could do something tomorrow that would expose the whole game, and then where would we be? No, Charles, I love you. I want us to marry and live a good, peaceful life. How can we with all that hanging over us? Oh, Allison, darling... Darling, you don't really know what you're suggesting. Ma- look, maybe if we could get him to leave the country... You said there were only two ways to deal with a black man. To keep paying... No, no, to murder him is unthinkable. George Hamill asked me to stop by at his office this afternoon. Why? He's not stupid. The story you gave my father about helping ex-convicts as a public relations stunt didn't wash with him. He wanted to know what I know. Well, he was just fishing. The best way would be to make it look like an accident. Allison, we... Hear me out. A car accident. How? If I cracked up with Clint in the car, I might be the one who gets it. And what guarantee do we have that that he would die? No, you can't be in the same car. If he were in another car and you were following him, and if you raced ahead of him and cut him off and forced him to crash off the road... Oh, if, if, if. It's too iffy. It's... It's so impossible. It's so dreamlike. It was a dream. Last night I dreamt you were in a car with me. We saw Clint up ahead of us. I said, there's Clint ahead of us. Cut him off and make him crash. Faster, faster. We've nearly caught him. Now we're alongside him. Push him over. Cut in front of him. Then I woke up. I was calling out. I was afraid someone had hurt. Oh, my darling. It was all so real. That's Clint now. Honey, you go out the back door. I'll phone you later. I'm going to stay and meet him. No. I'm staying. I've got something to say to him. He won't like your being here. Well, it sure took long enough. 
What's the idea, Powell? Uh, this is my fiance, Allison McCready. What's she doing here? Will you come in and stop being childish? I ain't saying a thing. You got nothing on me. And remember, Mr. Powell, you got a lot more to lose than I have. I'm not going to lose anything, Mr. Livitz. You're going to gain by my being here. Yeah? Mr. Powell has told me his story, and I agree that it must not get out. Go on. I have a lot more money than... Let me put it this way. Charles and I are going to be married. We want you to leave the country. Oh, 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 oh. I bet you do. Now look, Clint, you'll do better by accepting our proposition. We intend to hand you $50,000. And an airplane ticket. One way. And never come back. And never come back. Well, I always wanted to travel, but... What? 50 G's. Just chicken free. Well, that's all there is. Not enough. I'm thinking around a quarter of a million. Out of the question. I'm not going to bargain with you. I can raise 100000 No, Allison. It's worth it, Charles, if we can depend on Clint to wipe the whole matter out of his memory and just go away. Oh, you can depend on me. I'll keep my bargain. Then it's a deal? A deal. Good. It'll take about ten days to raise the money. I ain't in a hurry. You are. And, uh, speaking of money, that was the reason I, uh, came tonight, Charlie. Yeah, here. That's 500. What? I said a G like the last... That's all I could raise in a hurry. When that runs out, I'll have more. You went through that first thousand awfully fast. Well, I got rolled in that bow where I had the trouble. Oh, that reminds me. Your trial comes up in less than three weeks. Yeah. Lawyer called me at my hotel. To see if I was still around, I guess. Our plan is for you to jump your bail. I'll forfeit the 5000 I put up for it. And get you out of the country. With a keister full of green. Now, wait. I ain't got a passport. Now, that can be arranged, Clint. Just leave that to me. Okay, friends. You got yourself a deal. Say, Charlie. Hmm? You're going to put this meal on your expense account, I hope. <laughs> Too rich for your blood, George? <laughs> Too rich for my pocket. Well, that's J.P.'s favorite French restaurant. Oh, yeah. Nice to have wealthy, high-paid executives for friends. <laughs> I'm a simple man. I like simple things. And I like simple answers. Me? How long are you going to cling to that cockamamie story about your helping ex-cons rehabilitate themselves? Well, it's the McCoy, George. That guy got something on you, Charles. Pardon, monsieur, the telephone for you. Oh, uh, yes, thank you. Where is it? It is here, monsieur. I will plug it in for you. Thank you. <laughs> Just like the movie. Yeah. Hello? Charles? Oh, yes, Allison. I know George Hamels with you, Elsie. Told me you were lunching with him. Listen to what I'm going to say, but don't let on to George. Uh, yes, 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 dear. Uh... Allison says hello, and to remind you that in two and a half weeks, she wants to see you at the church promptly at 11. <laughs> I'll try to remember. Okay. He's all set, darling. Now, what's so important? It's got to be tonight. I'll have the house all to myself. Uh, why is the color scheme so important? The housekeeper and her husband are going into town to see their 15-year-old son in the high school play. Well, I don't see that that's such a problem. Choose whatever color will make the bridesmaids happy. Rent a car and let Clint take it to drive out and be here promptly at nine. Do not come together. You come out in your own car, but first report it broken down. Have it picked up tomorrow morning. You bring it back after it's all over. Understand? We did not see each other. You couldn't get here because your car was out of order. Oh, yes, yes, I follow, dear. I follow. I'm, I'm not sure I agree. I have a twenty-two target pistol. I know how to use it. Yes, I... I know you have to ask him to come, dear, but... Then what do we do with the unwelcome guest? There's a spot about a hundred yards behind the house. We get him out there in a wheelbarrow. There's a hole, an old cesspool. We drop him in, quick climb. Gardner's got several bags. But, uh... Suppose the gardener wants to supply some flowers for it. He's gone over a year fired. We didn't hire one after that. As soon as it's all over, we'll take the rental car and dump it over the edge of the road near town... You know that bad place where there's no shoulder on the road and only a flimsy guardrail? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I, I, I know. I know. We dump the car there. Let it smash up if it catches fire, so much the better. Then you take me back to the house and rush back to the city. Report the rental car stolen. 
You've been in your apartment all evening. Understand? Yes, uh... The color scheme suits me fine, dear. You sure have it all planned. No baubles, uh... No slip-ups. All planned. Yes, I'll, I'll be in my office till late tonight. Nine, at least, if you want to reach me. Good. That was for George's ears, wasn't it? Yes, that's correct, Allison. I, uh... Now, look, I have a report to get out, uh... If you've completed your instructions, I'll get back to my lunch with George. Goodbye, dear. <laughs> wow. That's only the beginning, Charlie. Wait till she gets you signed on the dotted line. Mr. Powell, Mr. Powell, something terrible's happened. What is it, Elsie? It's been a terrible accident on the late ship. Man's caught in a machine. The big press, they said. Oh, good Lord. Has the hospital been called? I don't know. Well, call him on your phone. I've got to use this one. Yes, sir. I'll call. And then call down to the plant. Tell him I'm coming down. If it's what I think it is, the machine will have to be partially dismantled. Yes, sir. Hello? Allison, listen, there's a change of plans. Charles, where are you? I'm still at the office. Something's happening. It's 8.30. He'll be here at 9. Yes, I know. He has the rental car. I got it for him. When will you be here? Well, there's been a bad accident on a night shift. A man's caught in the big metal press. I've got to help get him out. But us? What about us? Well, when he comes, stall him. Just tell him what happened, why I'm delayed. I haven't got the money, Charles. Tell him I'm bringing the money, the airplane ticket, and the passport. Just stall him. I'll do my best, but hurry. He scares me. car from you people this morning. No, 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 no. No, there's nothing wrong with the car. I just want to report it stolen. The City Fire and Car Service. Look, I uh, asked for my car to be picked up in my driveway. It's still here, and I, I called, or rather, my secretary called at 10 this morning. My name is Charles Powell. <laughs> Uh, just a moment. Oh, George. George, it's uh, kind of late for a visit. Come in. Thanks. I, uh, I, I was just trying to phone Allison. Well, what a night this has been. Uh, there was an accident at the plant. Uh, Peterson, I hope they don't have to have you take. I heard. Yes, and then uh, when I got outside, I had a date with Allison. The car that I had rented this morning was, uh, was missing. It was stolen. What happened to that great, big, powerful foreign job of yours? Oh, uh, it wouldn't start this morning. Uh, had Elsie call the service people, but they haven't picked it up yet. I just called them. They they uh, have a night answering service. You've had a busy evening. Yeah, very. Well, I think I can clear up one of your puzzles, Charlie. Your rental car was found with a thief in it. You uh, caught him? Dead. Burned to a cinder. Oh, 
Must have been going at a terrific speed. Tire marks on the road as he went off. Uh, Cracked up and burned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some kid? No. This may surprise you. It's your protege, Clint Livitz. We found enough of him to identify him. And a slightly burnt, but still usable bankroll of sizable proportions. Well, that uh, closes his case, doesn't it? And opens up several others. Incidentally, where were you all evening? Uh, home. I, uh, after I got back from the plant... You didn't go out? Well, I told you, my rental car got stolen. I came home by cab to change my clothes. The, uh, the big car is out of commission. I won't play games with you, Charlie. I checked it in the driveway just before I came up. The engine is still quite warm. You want to explain that? No, I don't want to explain. Charlie, I'm arresting you for murder. I must warn murder. you that what... George, what are you talking about? Are you accusing me of Clint Livett's death? No, no, that was obviously an accident. I'm holding you for the murder of Allison McCready, the girl you were going to marry. And in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, my prosecution of Charles Powell or Robert Hagen has been a painful task. I was his best friend. It was difficult to believe that he would kill the woman he loved, but the evidence is conclusive. Charles killed his lovely fiancée because she discovered his real identity, an escaped convict, a killer sentenced to life for another murder. The testimony of the housekeeper, Mrs. Francis, cannot be doubted. She did not leave the house, as he thought. She saw him run from the house, jump into his car, and race away. And then she discovered the body of Allison McCready shot through the head. Your Honor, may I... May I make a statement before you pronounce sentence? I did not kill Allison. I loved her. To say anything more in my defense is useless and unnecessary. Allison is dead. All I ask is that I be given the chance to follow her. Swiftly. And efficiently. And so a man is twice accused of murder and twice sentenced for the crime. A weary man who asks only to be allowed to follow the woman he loved. I'll be back shortly. Take the time to listen. Take the time to care. If I know you Just died. I'm so happy for you. Meet Mrs. McNulty. How do you do? Did you know you have spinach on your teeth? Oh, that's wonderful. This is Mr. Jackson. Nice to meet you. I have bubonic plague. Oh, yes, Mr. Plague. Meet Miss. Reception lines aren't the only places people don't listen. When you Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. And there we have it, Charles Powell's joust with fate. What difference did it make that he knew that Clint had murdered Allison? They didn't believe him. And he was too weary to try to make them believe. Our cast included Larry Haynes, Ann Meacham, Jackson Beck, Sidney Walker, and Tom Keener. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. 
now, a preview of our next tale. I don't understand it. Tub's bone dry, ma'am. Hasn't been used. Now, not, not tonight, anyway. His clothes. Howard's clothes. He'd empty his suitcases and put his clothes in the closet. Here's his suitcases, too. Just ladies' clothes. Yours, ma'am? Yes. Hey, look, look, this dream you had. It was no dream. Okay, okay, so maybe you imagined... I didn't imagine anything. Do you imagine a husband? Do you imagine a month-long honeymoon? Do you imagine a man in a chair with a knife in his chest? Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time...